Hi everybody and uh, thanks so much for being here. We're so delighted to host this forum. It's, um, it, it's been fascinating this morning. I've really enjoyed the uh, discussion. In fact, my overriding impression is I wish my whole team could be here uh, listening into this. There's so much to learn. Um, we touched at the end of that last panel on the subject of technology and I thought what I would do with you is just stand back a little bit. Um, and look at the subject of what happens when whole markets change the way they interact with each other, where there are not just technology, but process changes and, and, and kind of a, a change in the way of doing business. And I thought I'd also just, for some of this, take you a little bit away from the property uh, business as well to give you some analogies that maybe helpfully, hopefully give you a sense of how big the opportunity is here and why now, I think, is, is the moment it's going to start to happen. Um, and the, I thought I would try and capture it in a sentence, what, what, I, what I'm believing here, which is that this is a unique moment, that the, the property market uh, is entering this whole new era, actually, of the way that it works, and try and give you some evidence for why I think that's the case. Um, just by way of a little bit of context first, um, my background is, is innovating over the last 20, 30 years. Much of it has been in and around financial services, and in particular payments. Um, uh, Tony touched on earlier the MasterCard and uh, PayPass, and I was certainly involved in some of those early days of mobile payments. Uh, but I led the rollout of contactless in the UK, which was a subject I'm going to talk a bit more about, so I think there are some analogies for us. But I've also been involved in fast-moving consumer goods and trying to change a market which is really established and very hard for, uh, like coffee. Um, and I've also been a, an advisor um, on innovation to Roche. Uh, I was part of their board globally for looking at how pharmaceuticals as an industry can move quicker and be more innovative. And you can imagine the regulatory challenges, uh, for good reason, of course, um, in the pharmaceutical industry. So I've seen it from quite a few places, and um, certainly the way, therefore, I come in and look at the property market perhaps is a little different. The analogy that I thought I would start with, and so you've got 10 minutes here where you can relax, you don't need to think about the property market for 10 minutes. Um, the analogy I thought I would do was the moment in about 2007 when a group got together and said, let's replace cash. <laughs> that is a crazy, crazy thing to say. Let's do something that's more convenient. Uh, cash is, is a nuisance for everybody involved. Um, so you know, to come out with a statement and say, we could replace it, we could do things differently, is every bit as crazy as saying in the property market, hey, why don't we all just work more collaboratively? And in my experience, when presented with a crazy proposition like that, um, people have some rational objections. And I, I do want to stress that I think these are rational. Um, the property market, I think, gets sometimes a bad rap, and people say, oh, they're just not very innovative, they don't want to change. I, I don't believe that's the case at all. I think property people struggle with a very difficult process and a complicated setup. Um, but uh, actually, it's very rational to have some doubts about whether these things are going to change. And the three that I see time and time again are, firstly, if you've never seen something before, it's quite hard to believe it. And the Edwardians didn't believe in giraffes, because understandably, it sounds kind of weird if you've never seen one. Um, previous failed attempts, if you've seen failures, that's... That kind of tells you, hmm, I don't think this is going to happen. And then finally, of course, what I call professionally cautious. Um, you know, most of us who take pride in our jobs are trained to be cautious about risk and not to do crazy stuff or just believe what they're told. And particularly, you know, in the legal profession, it's all about managing risk, but also in the estate agency where, of course, you know, you've got a responsibility to your customer to do things in a way that's going to help them. So these are, I think, three perfectly rational reasons to have some doubts, and certainly when we first talked about replacing cash, you would hear all three of these quite strongly. Um, if we look at why, you can see they were very strong in those days. Um, cash has been around for 3,000 years, and you want to replace it. Um, it began, the first coins were in Anatolia, the Lydian kingdom of 700 BC, now southern Turkey, uh, for those who were interested. No one, I'm seeing. Um, and cash is, was around in 2007, 194 countries. Would be 193, 194, for those who are curious, is the Vatican. And I checked, they use the euro. So yeah, they also have currency as well. So it's ubiquitous. 
there had been some very notable failures in the cash replacement. Some of you will remember Mondex, big trial in Swindon. They tried it again a few years later in Canada, and it also failed. And Visa had a go at it, actually, trying to create some new, new payment capability. And then, of course, in, in the money world, in financial services where I come from, if you're not careful about things like security and accessibility, you know, obviously you're not taking your job seriously. So three really rational reasons to have doubt that something as daft as a group of people saying we're going to replace cash would ever happen. Um, but there are also some reasons that you can look out for when a market is about to change that give you hope say that there's opportunity. Um, firstly, is this a new era? Is something different from history? Are there new possibilities? The second is, is it being approached differently? Is what's being proposed actually not the same as what's failed previously? And then finally, is there enough activity? And I'll show you why in a minute, why that can overcome the professional caution. Uh, and in the cash market, all of these were very true. There was uh, new technology and a new attitude amongst the banks to innovation. Suddenly they realised they had to in the early 2000s. And of course consumers were getting used to taking up new ways of things because they were paying online. The approach was very different. Those Mondex and Visa Cash trials were a closed system. There were a limited number of people who could only work with that system. When markets are open and technology and capabilities are available to everyone, it's very different. Uh, and it was also made effortless to use. You had to sign up for things like uh, Mondex. If you could make it so you didn't have to sign up, it just worked, that would be very different as well. Really different approach, lower barrier, more open. And then finally, was there significant uh, activity? There was. I, I led a difficult period where I was spending several million a year at Barclays pumping out cards long before it was clear this was going to take off. We had a good coalition with MasterCard and Visa and others. We managed to get them to stop calling the technology each something different, which was a success. That's how we ended up with contactless. Um, and the retailers were starting rollout programs and winning over retailers was a big part of this. Worth saying, by the way, we never thought the cards would still be around today. The whole idea of this was to make it possible to do mobile payments. But it was rolling, and so I became in 2007 the world's first director of contactless in a job which, I'll be honest, all of my friends thought was suicidal. But not just thanks to me, thanks to a very broad coalition of very brilliant people. This is what happened, and you can see after a slow start, use of contactless grew very, very strongly. Cash, as we predicted, the top graph is it replacing, being replaced by debit cards. The bottom graph is ATM withdrawals. Exactly what we predicted did eventually happen. And I want you to remember the shape of that big graph, because we're going to see it again a bit later. One of the reasons that happened, and the thing that I wanted to bring to your light about professional caution is, is this picture. Now, many of you will know this, the famous adoption curve. It's often accredited to Jeffrey Moore in his early 80s, crossing the chasm text, but actually I found it existed in the late 50s. It was used in farming technology, interestingly enough. But what it is is basically the demographic of the population, and on the far left, you've got the most innovative people, on the far right, the least innovative people. And, you know, you will maybe know some people, probably not in this room, uh, who are, you know, on the right-hand side, who haven't got a smartphone yet. Um, and there'll be other people who are always the ones with the latest iPhone. Um, and their attitude is, is quite different to technology and indeed to market change generally, to new procedures and processes. Uh, on the left, people are the kind of, wow, wow, that sounds cool, I'll give it a go. And the people on the right are... I'll never use it. Now, the important thing to, to bear in mind here is that whenever anyone talks about market-wide change, quite often it's natural for your mind to drift to the right-hand side and go, well, I can't imagine they'll ever do that. And actually, that isn't actually what stops the market happening, and here's why. And the reason is, is it fills up from the left. You get the early adopters, who will, uh, the innovators, and then the early adopters who will take up something new. And something rather remarkable happens once that group do it. And by the way, I suspect there are quite a few in this room, almost by definition. Oh, someone's got a smartphone. Um, because what happens is once they take it up, 
the early majority look over at them and they go, well, if they're using it, it's probably all right. And what's actually happened here is how innovative the product is, how risky it is, has gone down. So in other words, if lots of people are doing something a new way, everybody else can relax a bit because it looks like it works. And of course, once half the population are using it, the late majority follow, and eventually the laggards. And today, 93% of people use contactless cards. And I can promise you, when we did our original tests, there was a good chunk of them who would not have touched it with a barge pole. And what they always say when you interview them <laughs> is like, well, everyone's doing it. It's normal. And I think that's what's going to happen in our industry as well, that some of the things we're talking about today are just going to become normal. So let's turn now to the property market. You've got to come back now. <laughs> You've had your little holiday. Uh, you're back now in the property market and this belief that maybe we're right at the moment of a completely new era of the way this market is going to work. Now, hopefully, as I've said that, there's a bit of your brain has triggered these three because you're sophisticated, intelligent people and therefore quite rationally you go, really, Dan? Really? You know, Never seen it before, been some failed attempts, and besides, I don't take things lightly, I'm, I'm professionally cautious. And we could illustrate these with some facts. Um, conveyancing's been around quite a long time, even longer than Rob, actually, interestingly. Only just, but a little bit longer. Um, 1823, there was a gathering in Chancery Lane, I believe, that split the barristers and solicitors, and that sort of kicked off conveyancing. Uh, land registry been around since uh, 1862. So, but certainly within all of our lives, the way things are done has, has not changed so dramatically as we heard from Ian and Rob at the beginning. Um, We've had some notable failures, some big investments by credible people, the Land Registry, the Law Society, to try and create some kind of collaborative technology for the market, uh, and they failed. So we've got examples where it didn't work, which makes us think it's impossible. And then, of course, our natural you know, concern about things like security and legals. So lots of reasons to believe this isn't the beginning of a new era. It's never going to change. There's going to be a forum like this in 50 years that's exactly the same. Hope. <laughs> this is the hope slide. So why might it be different this time? And I believe it is. I believe it absolutely is. Um, the first is the technology is different. And that was touched on in the panel there. Uh, Peter Ambrose are arguing very strongly for the power of technology. There are a bunch of new technologies which are pretty ubiquitous now, which help enormously with collaboration. The consumers, the clients, our customers, they want it. Um, there's been huge impetus uh, coming from uh, our post-COVID for digitization. And of course, we're seeing a lot of new ideas coming in from outside as well. The, the property market is, is no longer an island. Um, I think one of the differences in the approach now is no one is proposing some kind of centralized single thing. What's happening is a market-wide movement, and I'll touch on some of the people involved in that, but there is this huge movement towards technologies that can help us work together. And the other thing we're seeing emerging, and I'm proud that Kojute is at the center of this, is helping to create open standards that anyone can use. In the same way we saw with cash, it doesn't help to have an island. You want stuff open that anyone can use. And then finally, in terms of significant activity, the most extraordinary influx of money, 1.6 billion pounds coming in in PropTech VC. And that's just PropTech. I haven't included in that law tech or FinTech, which also comes in. Um, that is a 16 times increase since 2016. It's quite extraordinary. Um, globally, we're not alone. 15 and a half billion coming into VC uh, globally in prop tech. Uh, that is about double last year and about triple 2016. So massive influx of investment. I think the government initiatives are really interesting in this space. Government no longer trying to impose stuff, but setting out frameworks and standards for data, for innovation and so on. Encouraging an open market, not just in the property market, but certainly got a good old mention in the leveling up paper, some of the, certainly some of the things we're involved in. 
And then this forum, you know, the biggest gathering of conveyancers and estate agents probably ever held to talk about collaboration. It's incredibly symbolic, I think, but also it's the beginning of that adoption curve. Forums like this, you are the vanguard who are saying, we want this to be different. We're going to start driving that difference. So I think that easily signifies the kind of scale of movement that shifts a market. And when I look at companies, and you're going to hear in a panel the six on the left there, you know, whether it's Gazelle with reservations or Mio with sales progression, a Landmark with data, you know, Move Butler streamlining the process, uh, you know, Legal Eye risk and control, and Visa looking at Vea looking at titles. These are all solutions that are helping to speed things up, are helping to get folks sharing and working with data together. And they're by no means alone, not just the panel you'll see, but all of these companies on the right, and many more, I hasten to add, CRM, CMSs, for whom on their agenda, connectivity, collaboration. They're investing themselves, never mind the VCs, themselves, millions of pounds in trying to get this all working together. So a huge change, I think, happening from the companies in the market. And of course, I wouldn't want to leave anyone else out who wasn't on that chart. What you're really seeing is two kinds of thrusts going on. One is the players themselves who are involved in the transaction at the top wanting to connect and collaborate using technology and wanting to work differently. But then many service providers at the bottom providing the services and data that they need to do it, also investing. Um, and what's fascinating is it, these players are connecting to each other in all sorts of different ways. So massive investment going on at the moment into connectivity and integration. And I'd be remiss not to mention Kojute, uh, which provides a common backbone that anyone can use and which has the advantage you plug in once and you're plugged into everybody else. Um, that's part of the picture. That gives an open standard. You can use the same standards to plug to each other if you want, but it allows that, that connectivity. So we, we won't do it on our own, quite the contrary. In fact, any of the solutions, if anyone tells you there's a silver bullet, it's not true. What's making the difference is this market movement of players who are all looking to do this and who now can work together. So one of the questions you might then frame is, OK, Dan, I get it. It's the beginning of a new era. It's all going to be absolutely amazing. Why don't I see it? Why is my experience in my day-to-day -day practice still as challenging as I heard on the panel? And the analogy I like to use with market change is, is the tree. And if you've ever planted a tree, you get from the, the garden place like a stick with sticks. <laughs> yeah, it's not very impressive. And you, you go to the effort of planting it, and two years later, it's done stuff all. I mean, it's just sitting there like a blinking stick, and you wonder whether you've, you've bought a decent tree or not. Um, and of course, what's going on is under the ground, it's putting down roots. That's what trees do. And then suddenly, it starts going up top, and you go, oh, thank goodness for that. I've bought a decent tree. And it's a really good analogy for what goes on with market change. Everybody expects linear change when markets shift. They expect a line like this, that over time it just gets better and better equally each year. Um, and that's not what happens. What happens is it always follows this sort of curve because at the beginning it's putting down roots. So in contactless, this was the period where we were agreeing the standards for things like mobile payments. We were doing deals with retailers to get them to start rolling it out. We were issuing millions of cards. It takes a long time to issue 15 million cards and so on. And so during that period, it looks like not much is happening, but a ton is happening. And then finally it takes off. And you saw that shape in the contactless curve. It's exactly that shape. And so my experience when I'm working with markets that are trying to do things very differently is always a game of two halves. There's this first blue bit where everyone's going, oh dear, you know, I don't think this is happening. This is very disappointing. And then the second blue bit where everyone goes, wow, where did that come from? I wasn't expecting that. Um, and that's just the nature of it. And I personally think we are firmly in that first bit where people are saying, is anything ever going to change? And the answer is, yes, it is. There's an immense amount of root building going on of which, of which this forum is one. So that's why I believe, actually, this is a really fascinating moment in the property market. I think the 
the various powers are arrayed now with a level of energy and interest from the market, from the consumers, with VC money coming in, with every company in the industry pretty much investing and looking at collaborative and connectivity. I think now is the moment it's really beginning to shift. And I think we will see a real sea change over the next five, certainly 10 years, where the market will look quite different. And in the way that once it's happened, has happened in contactless with cash, we all say, well, that was obvious. Yeah, no big deal. We don't use cash much anymore. Actually, at the time, it seemed crazy. And I think it'll be the same in 10 years. We'll take it for granted. And forums like this will seem very strange that we didn't know that it was possible to massively improve communication, collaboration, data sharing, and so on using tech. So a really exciting time, and I, I also want to commend this forum, actually, because there are moments in a, in a market's history where special things start to happen, and I think, I think forums like this will be a bit of a milestone where people look back and say, do you remember the Esters Forum of 22? That group of people getting together to talk about how collaboration could be better. For me, that, that's a real marker, and so you guys should be very proud, I think, of yourselves of being pioneers in driving this change, and, and many others will follow, I'm, I'm sure of it, and I hope will embrace some of the exciting technologies that you'll, you'll hear about today and, uh, and hopefully Kojute as well. Thank you very much.